what you're prepared to fight for, reveals what is most important to you. Family, kids, dreams, ambitions, friends, money, career. The question is, of all the things worth fighting for in your life, does your faith make it on the list? Are you prepared to fight for faith? The new dispensation of faith we just immediately now have woken up to with, with different sets of questions or new sets of questions being asked about, especially the church, about our motives, about our plans and our actions in this new dispensation of faith, which is leaving church leaders everywhere perplexed and even anxious about what the future of the church will look like. Now, you add on to that as, uh, as well. Now, some of the pressing and exasperating pressures and anxieties that people are currently suffering, you cannot help but wonder, will the church remain somewhat relevant to people in this day and age? Will the church remain relevant to people in this day and age? Has God got some, uh, anything relevant to say to us through the challenges that we are currently facing? Anything to anchor us on, on what we need to be believing? Anything to offer us some guidance on the life choices that we need to be making? Has he got anything to say to us at all? The book of Jude will say to us, yes, emphatically. And in fact, it will call us to take action in the following ways. And so number one, the book of Jude will challenge you to actually regain your will to fight for the faith. Now more than ever, there's a need to fight for the faith. The second thing the book of Jude will do is that it encourages us to guard against, you need to guard, be vigilant against socially acceptable ethics and morals from creeping in slowly into the life of the church and then diverting us from the holiness of God. The third thing the book of Jude will challenge us to do is, is to resist the temptation of domesticating our faith into a powerless faith in these two realms. And so firstly, we domesticate the faith into a, a powerless religion of so-called love, or we domesticate it into just simply becoming sticklers of a doctrine, while in both camps, we make no call to radical transformation at the word of God. And then the th uh, fourth thing the book of Jude will challenge us with is to keep discovering and keep rooting ourselves in the gospel of Jesus Christ and not just make general assumptions of it. Because when we make general assumptions of the gospel, we, you lose the weight and the intensity that Jesus Christ must bear over our, love as lo our lives as Lord. And when we lose that intensity and that weight, it leads to apathy. And then apathy starts to lead to compromise. And compromise suffers the judgment of God. Suffer the judgment of God. And so a call to action the book of Jude will put before us. May we embrace the call to take action and be people who will fight for faith. And so let's jump in into the book of Jude. Short little later, just one chapter. And so let's look at the first few verses. And so Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, beloved in God, the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. May mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Now, Jude and James were the half-brothers of Jesus Christ. Now, they didn't believe in him at first until he did that small little thing of rising back from the dead. That's what then convinced them that he had to be the son of God and the Messiah who came to die on the cross for our sins. And so then following that, they went on to become prominent leaders in the early church. Now Jude is very clear and specific about the reason and the purpose for why he writes his letter. Look at verse three. Beloved, although I was very eager 
to write to you about a common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. There's the purpose of the letter. Contend, literally meaning strenuously fight to defend. Strenuously fight to defend the faith. Now, what is this faith that needs to be contended for? Uh, contended for? Now, by the faith, Jude doesn't mean just simply kind of feelings of, of, of trust and surrender to God. Notice that he's been very specific. The faith, he says, being very specific about what he's referring to and not just faith in an abstract sense. And so what do New Testament writers mean when they talk about the faith? Simply put, they are talking about the collective body of truths, plural that constitute the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what they're all referring to when they talk about, when the Bible talks about the faith, the body of truth, the collective body of truth that speaks about the gospel of Jesus, of Jesus Christ. And so Jude is writing to his readers and appealing to them to strenuously fight to defend truths that ought to be believed about the gospel of Jesus Christ. I am writing to you, he says, appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. And so, uh, saints, and so they weren't just handed feelings, but truths. And so there are many places in the New Testament that we can turn to that actually articulates what is this body of truths that constitutes the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, that then ought to be believed and ultimately contend for. And so one such place is the first letter to the Corinthians, uh, chapter 15, where the Apostle Paul, talking about the gospel, the content of the gospel, he, say, uh, uh, he writes and he says this, for I delivered, 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 delivered. <laughs> 1 Corinthians 15, okay? Not, not on the screen. There we go. There we go. For I delivered... Re, uh, take note there, same language as Jude is talking about. And so, for I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, that is Peter, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Uh, have fallen asleep. And so the Apostle Paul summarizes the content of the gospel into the following. And so number one, that Christ Jesus died in our place for our sins. And so his death was like no other in that it achieved the forgiveness of our sins before God. The second thing he says, he says is this, that Christ Jesus was buried and raised to life. And so it worked. We can be confident that Jesus Christ sacrificed on our behalf worked. Why? Because God did not allow him to remain dead, but raised him triumphantly to laugh. And then the third thing the Apostle Paul summarizes about the, uh, the truth of the gospel is that Christ Jesus appeared to many as proof of his resurrection. And so having then been proven as the one who has conquered death, he then must reign supreme as Lord of all. And so this body of truths Collective body of truth is so rich and so deep in its implications that it must equally shape what we choose to believe about Joburg and the kind of lives we will choose to lead in the city. And so Jude essentially is saying to his readers, you want to know, you want to know or have an anchor that will hold you fast on what you need to be believing. You want to know how to make choices in life that will lead to a thriving life. Contend for the faith 
the gospel, this deep well of truths about Jesus Christ because it is what you need to keep transforming your life. And so the call to contend, to fight for the faith is essentially a call to find Jesus, to drill deep into in Jesus Christ, knowing the fullness of what it means of, of Jesus Christ, and then strenuously fight to defend it, the treasure that you're finding in Jesus Christ at all cost. And so called to contend for the faith. Now, who is Jude addressing this to? Now, Jude does not specify the destination of his letter at all. Uh, at all. And so we know that he's speaking to Christians. Why? Uh, why? Because he calls them beloved in God and saints. But who exactly are these beloved saints? We don't know. And so in a sense, Jude is speaking to nameless Christians. Nameless Christians. Just park that for a moment. Now, some significant facts Help us actually na narrow down when exactly the Jude, Jude possibly wrote this letter to somewhere around the mid to late AD 60s is when Jude wrote this letter, which then makes this letter so significant to its audience and super relevant to us today in its context. The AD 60s was literally a bloody period of martyrdom for the elders and the apostles of the early church. And here are some notable ones. And so James, Jude's own brother, was brutally killed, murdered for his faith around AD 62. The apostle Peter and Paul, depending on where exactly you choose to actually uh, uh, um, position the writing of Jude's letter, are both either under arrest, arrest, facing imminent martyrdom, or have already been executed for their faith, somewhere around AD 64 to 67. And so can you just imagine for a moment the vacuum of leadership that the early church must have been experiencing during the AD 60s as, as these pillars of apostleship, one by one, are getting taken out in such a short period space of time in history. You want to kill a movement, then just wipe out, eliminate charismatic leaders like James, Paul, and Peter from that movement all at once and watch it die, right? And so get this, Jude, in the face, in the face of all this, still somehow finds the courage and the boldness to call the church in its despairing time to actually fight and contend for the faith. The persecution of the early 60s rocked the Christian faith at its core. Rocked it at its core. And they are saying, would have left many wondering whether they had any hopes of survival in the absence of the big names. Jude's response to that isn't to say, well, guys, let's pack it up. All is lost. No, instead, having witnessed the second of his older biological brothers being executed for the gospel, Jesus and now James, he still finds the courage and the boldness to call the church and say, listen, the ongoing life and future vibrancy of the church in the faith is now in your hands. It is now in your hands. Fight for it at all cost. So it is with us. So it is with us today. With no destination, specific destination to his letter, Jude might as well be speaking to us directly today. Nameless Christians as we are, and yet equally being called to contend and fight for the faith in our trying days. 
the ongoing orthodoxy and future vibrancy of our local churches is in our hands. It is in our hands. And so we are actually, we are the nameless heroes who are being called to contend for the faith. We are the nameless heroes. Every single one of us who are in Christ, the nameless heroes who are being called to contend for the faith. Now imagine one of these nameless heroes that receives this letter from Jude, reads it, and be like, hey, my male chief, can we talk for a moment? Right? We are just normal, ordinary folks. How can you place this on us? Expect us to fight for the faith when the mighty ones have fallen. I don't, do not have the pedigree or the theological astuteness of a poor or the uncompromising zeal and practical common sense of a James, or the intimacy and personal relationship, our witness relationship that Peter would have had with Jesus. And so how can you place this on us? I also imagine them being just as busy with their everyday responsibilities like we are just as much under pressure and anxious under the challenges of their day, just as much as we are, and just as much as under attack to compromise on truth from their society, just as much as we are. And so, sure, Jude, why are you placing this on us? Why would you place this on us? When I was growing up in the DRC, around 10 years old, the school that I went to had all sorts of cliques in the various age groups. And so in my age group, the boys, it was an amazing thing. Well, maybe not so amazing now that you look at it, but an amazing thing happened in the, bo- in the age group with the boys in my age group is they self-organized into various camps and crews that felt gang-like. And so uh, uh, depending on all sorts of factors and politics of boyhood at age 10, the crew that you were in could all of a sudden find itself on top of all the other crews, right? And so there was always constantly a jostling of power or an attempt to coup that was happening all, all the time during, uh, in, in, our, in our age group. And so one day after school, I decided to go to the property around the corner that sold frozen yogurt. Now, rule number four was never roll on your own. But I was part of the ruling crew at the time and was known to, to be able to handle myself. So I thought, ah, no biggie. I'm just going to, to the corner and back. And so I get onto that property, start looking around. There are other kids from school, uh, school there. When all of a sudden from the corner of my eye, I see some other cat from another crew also walk in, looks around briefly, and then walks out. And I'm like, mm, that did not look right at all. Now him I could take. I was comfortable with that, but now I'm starting to feel like isolated uh, at this moment. So I'm thinking, sure, better get back to school and to, uh, to my crew. The moment I stepped out that, the, that gate, I am ambushed by four or five others. And I'm thinking like, ah, too late to pull out of this one. And so it's about to go down. And only God knows how I come out. When all of a sudden, at just the last moment, I am saved from a good beating by my older sister. (laughs) Turns out, as they were waiting, conspiring outside to ambush me, some kids were walking past and heading back towards the school, and my older sister and her friends were walking towards that direction, and they told us, hey, your younger brother is about to go meet his maker. And so just in the nick of time, time, as I'm waiting for what felt like an eternity for the onslaught to begin, she pops around the corner and asks, what the heck is going on here? And I'm like, I don't know, ask them, right? (laughs) And so the whole situation gets diffused and I run back to school to find my career and I'm like, sure, guys, that was almost me, man. And so only then to find out that one of the guys who had ambushed me I had just moments earlier after school taken a beating from two members of my crew. And so 
I, and so I figured that as they were all them walk, walking home, they must have spotted me go onto, uh, onto that property and thought to themselves, payback time. And so essentially, I had been ambushed for something I had no knowledge of, which taught me such an important lesson that day. And it is this, that the worst kind of fight you do not want to find yourself in is the fight that you did not know that you were in. That the worst kind of fight that you do not want to find yourself in is the fight that you did not know that you were in because it's too late at that point to realize that you're actually in a fight when you did not realize that it had already begun. Worst kind of fight to be in. And so listen to me, sisters, brothers in Christ, many of us, are getting ambushed by the world because we're acting oblivious to the fight we're already in. We're acting oblivious to that fight. Look at what Jude tells his readers to contend for the faith in verse four. Listen to him. For certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation. Ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only master and Lord, Jesus Christ. And so why is Jude putting the defense of the faith on our nameless shoulders? Because there is a perversion of the grace of God and a denial of the Lordship of Jesus Christ in the context in which you're living your life. That's why he calls us to contend for the faith. And so wake up, Christian. You're already in a fight to preserve what you ought to hold dear, the grace of God and the Lordship of Jesus Christ, simply by living in a broken and sinful world. And so it's not a choice to fight for faith. It's not a choice. It's the only way you're going to survive the onslaught of a sinful world. For who else will contend and fight for the very things you have needed to make you who you are as a Christian today? The grace of God and the Lordship of Jesus Christ. If you will not contend for those two things, who else will? Because you have needed the grace of God and the Lordship of Jesus Christ so that you can stand reconciled and forgiven at the feet of the throne of God. And so fight for the faith. You have no choice but to fight for the faith. The battle has already begun. Do not act oblivious to it. And so listen, listen. Contending for the faith is a battle that you must wage with great alertness. Need to remain alert because it's a battle you cannot afford to lose. And so we are the nameless heroes called to contend for the faith with alertness. And so let me ask you this morning, how alert are you as a Christian? How alert are you as a Christian? You're just waking up each day, going to, you to your ground and coming back? Or are you remaining alert? Alert over what you ought to be believing. Alert over what you ought to be doing and living out. Why? Because you believe and have been founded upon the grace of God and the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And so life for you must be a life that has been transformed by the grace of God and the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Fight for faith and remain alert so that there will not be a perversion of the grace of God in your life and a subtle denial of the Lordship of Jesus Christ as you lead your life in this world. With the stakes being this high, I don't know about you, but I would need some kind of reassurance that it is even a fight that I can win. And so Jude 
gives us all the reassurance we need in the opening verse. Look at that. To those who are called, beloved in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. Those are not mere pleasantries. Knowing what he's about to call them to, Jude looks to reassure them of who they are, nameless as they are, but being called to be heroes who will prevail. And so three powerful reminders. Number one, they are called. That is called to be a Christian. And so being a Christian isn't just a status you claim for yourself. It is an identity you're given by God. And since it's God who gives you that identity, then you're guaranteed that by his authority, he will see you grow into the fullness of that very identity that he's calling you into. The second thing he says, beloved in God, in God. Notice here very carefully in the text, he says, beloved in God, the Father, and not just beloved by God, the Father. And so it's not just a love that God has for them, but it is a love that God has around them. And so they are being called not just to enjoy God's love for them, but to rest and anchor themselves in God's love around them. And so that means that God's love around them would first need to fail if they are to be then proven to be incapable of contending for the faith. And who shall separate us from the love of God? No one and nothing. And then the third thing Jude reminds them of is that they are kept for Jesus Christ. And so the very Jesus that they are contending for is the Jesus that God is preserving them for. Such has always been the grace of God, Right? So whenever he calls us, we choose to trust him and embark on the journey that he calls us to towards him. No matter how hard it gets on that journey, we actually end up discovering that he had actually been moving towards us. And so by, and so by reminding these nameless heroes that they have been called, that they have been loved and kept by God himself, says to us, that what is important, what is most important about you as you look to fight for faith is not who you are in relation to this world, but who you are in the presence of God. But who you are in the presence of God. And so God himself will work powerfully through these nameless heroes to see them prevail at contending for the faith. And because God will do that, it gives us all the assurance we need to fight for the faith. And so as we close, faced with the reality, the church today is faced with the reality and challenges that may leave her wondering whether she has what it takes to contend for the faith, to make it through, to survive through this season. Jude is here to tell us that we can. Why? Because God himself, who has called her, will sustain her and promises to keep her so that she will prevail through it all. And so fight for faith, unashamed and unafraid. Why? Because you are the nameless hero God is calling to prevail. May mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for your challenging word that confronts and speaks into our everyday life. And sometimes, Lord, when we think about what our lives are like and what we're going with, we, we can sometimes lose heart and, and feel like perhaps you do not understand. Perhaps you are slow to act. 
perhaps it's a hopeless cause. Such can be the reality as we think about our faith, confronted by the things that we are constantly confronted with in the world, socially, spiritually, emotionally, physically. We can be left wondering whether it is worth it to stand upon your grace and to stand upon your gospel as those you are called beloved and kept for Christ Jesus. I pray, O oh Lord, even in light of this difficult year that has been, that we will remain alert to what is really truly going on all around us. A fight. Contend for the faith. And that as we would embrace the score, we would do so through the strength that you will provide as your word says, so that in all things you might receive the glory. And as we do that, remind us and remind us that there's nothing better than Christ Jesus. And that as we will cling on to Christ Jesus, empowered by your spirit. We will prevail for the gospel of Christ. Challenging time to live, and yet also, what an awesome time to be alive. Because we get to display the power, the beauty, the authority, the lordship, the kingship of our great Lord and Savior. Empower your bride to fight for faith in this day and age. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.